back to chapter. This is the last message in 1 Samuel. I have no idea how long we've been in it, but we're about to finish it tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Uh, in the last few messages, we have learned about David reaping the fruit of his unbelief. We know that the Amalekites came and they raided the city that the Philistines had given to David and his men, the city of Ziklag. And they took all the men's families and all their possessions. And, but what we saw was how David responded to this great tragedy uh, in his life. We saw that in chapter 30, verse 6, that David first encouraged himself in the Lord his God. In verse 8, we saw that David inquired at the Lord. We saw that he was obedient. Verse 10, David pursued the enemies of God. Verse 17, David smote them. In verse 18, David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And it's a great picture, as we mentioned in our messages, on spiritual restoration. Seek God, pray and obtain God's guidance. Then go out and walk after the ways of God. Pursue the course that God has called you to walk in. And then once again, do battle with the enemies of God and watch and see if God won't restore into your hand all the blessings you lost during your time of failure, your time of backsliding, your backsliding, or your disobedience to the Lord, and see if He won't restore what He has, uh, what you have lost. Now let's look at 1 Samuel 30 and look at verse 14. Remember here, they've, they've got this uh, Egyptian who's been abandoned by his master, and they found him, and he's telling them what had happened. It says in verse 14, he says, We made an invasion. Upon the south of the Kirathites, and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God, thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me to the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. David smote them in the twilight, even in the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men, which rode upon camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. David covered all. David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. Now go back and look at verses 9 and 10 for just a minute. It says, so David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. And David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. And so we have 600 men going to chase down these Amalekites, and they get to this brook, and 200 of the men were unable to go with David. They were not able to pursue anymore. They were spent, physically speaking, and so they stayed behind with the stuff. 400 men go out and fight, and God blesses them with a great victory, and 200 men stayed behind to guard and protect what was theirs. Now look at verse 21. David came to the 200 men, which were so faint they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide in the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. I just want to pause there just for a minute and let you know that your Bible is not an outdated book. Uh, that is a military gesture to this day. Amen. What does a commanding officer do when he sees the army? Listen, soldiers don't shake hands. Soldiers don't embrace. They do what? They salute. Your this book's just as current as it needs to be. Look at verse 22. Now listen, pay attention here. It says, Then he answered all the wicked men and men of Belial, of those that went with David, of that 400, and they said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught to the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children that they may lead them away and depart. So they said, listen, we're not going to give them any of the loot. We're just going to give them their wife and their kids, and then they got to get going. We're not sharing anything else with them. Verse 23, Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, 
who had preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, look what it says, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall, sh they shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made a statute and ordinance for Israel unto this day. That's that word of prayer. Lord, we come before you again tonight. We pray that you bless in this message as we, uh, it's entitled, Find Your Place. Find Your Place. Help us to listen. Help us to be attentive. Help us to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. As he speaks to us, shows us, deals with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now listen, all aspects of a military campaign are equally important to the success of that military campaign. Listen, the frontline troops in any military engagement cannot survive without the effective working of the support troops in the rear. Amen? Everybody would agree with that? Uh, Robert E. Lee, Civil War, when he was finally forced to surrender at Appomattox to General Grant, he, he, was, he had to surrender first, it was only in part, Part because Grant's troops had overwhelmed him in Northern Virginia, but the large part of the reason why Grant had to surrender at Appomattox was because of what Sherman had done. Sherman had marched down from Atlanta down to the sea, and what he had he'd gone through the state, and he had cut off Lee's supply lines, and so Lee's men were starving to death. They didn't have the materials, they didn't have what they needed to continue to fight and move forward, and so between the supply lines being cut off, and, and the mass number of men that Grant had, Lee had no option. It was either face annihilation or surrender. And so he did. World War II, when our troops hit the, hit the shores there at Normandy, we blazed across Europe. We were successful. We thank God for that. Hey, when Hitler's troops went into Russia in World War II, they were not successful. They failed. What was the difference between our success as we blazed fast pace across Europe and the, and the failure of the Russians as they stalled out and failed in Russia? Our troops did not outrun the ability of the back and support troops to meet their needs, to continue to get the supplies to them, get what they needed. When Hitler sent his men in, they moved so fast and so quickly, and when they went so far afield and they spread so thin, that the frontline troops were unable to be supported by the troops in the rear. And it doesn't matter how powerful your fighting force is and how great an advance you've made against the enemy, you cannot win a military conflict and sustain that victory without proper and adequate support from the troops behind you, all the way from the home base to get the supplies to where you are out on the front line. Amen? So 400 men go to war, 200 stay behind, 400 come back and say, we're not sharing with you. David said, no, we're not going to have that. God gave the victory. Everybody's going to get their part. These men stayed behind and they tarried by the stuff. They tarried by the stuff. Now the Bible speaks in the New Testament of the Christian life. It describes it as being a life of warfare. Uh, Timothy is charged by the Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy 1.18. He says, war, a good warfare. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. The Holy Spirit says to us in 2 Timothy 2, 4, No man that warreth entangled himself in the affairs of his life. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 11, Put on the whole armor of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so our Christian life is described as warfare. What are we at war at with? We are at war with sin. We're at war with evil. We're at war with the world. We're at war with Satan. We are at war with all that is ungodly in this world. We are at war with everything that opposes or exalted itself against the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we see from the New Testament hey, that once we're saved, we are to be in conflict. We are to be engaged. We are to be in battle against all forces of evil in this world. And let me just make it real clear. Every one of us is to be engaged. After our salvation, the Lord gives to every saved man and every saved woman particular gifts and enablings wherewith they might, listen, serve him in this great war with sin and evil. 
Now we're going to take what we read in 1 Samuel 30 and we're going to run down a long path. And then we're going to come back to 1 Samuel 30. So if you're saying, let's make sure you get this. If you're saying God has enabled you, God has gifted you with talents and abilities that you might serve him in this great war against sin and evil. Don't turn there, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, that God divides those gifts, you want to call them gifts, talents, abilities. He says he divides them to every man severally as he will. It's his choice. It's his choice to say, you get this, and, and then the angel got saved, well, angel's going to get these gifts and enablings, and Adam's going to get those, and Miss Batson gets those, and Pastor McFarland gets those, and Sandy gets these. And it's, it's God's will, however he wants to distribute whatever he wants to give to each one of us. Amen? Would you agree with that? The Bible says that's what he does. God himself determined that when you got saved, what function you would have in his army. He, de he determined what place you would serve in his great army. He determined what abilities he would give you for use in his great army. And so if God puts every member of the body in a position where it pleased him, and if God has given every one of us a particular enabling where we can serve Him in this great warfare, then we are wrong in our thinking when we wish God gave us something else to do or when we envy what someone else place the position is or when we desire to be in another position rather than one that we are given. See, here's the thing. When you get saved and God begins to give you what He gives you, God knows exactly what you're able to do. God has given you the opportunity to do that. God has given you the ability to do that. That's your place. Okay? And so we learn from 1 Samuel 30, we learn from this passage that if I take the place God gave me, and, I, and in that place that God gave me, serve God with all my heart and all my strength to the best of my ability, listen to me, then when the rewards are handed out at the judgment seat of Christ, there will be no man and there will be no woman that has ever lived that will receive a greater reward than I will. That makes sense to me? If you serve and you do in the place that God has put you, and you do it to the best of your ability, and you do it faithfully to the day God calls you home, when the rewards are given out, no one else is going to get a greater reward than you're going to get for what you did. Not that same thing, this man. Okay? Well, I, I passed right on about that. Because, you know, this guy over here, you know, he, he led a thousand people in Christ. And this guy over here, he, well, he, you know, he just taught Sunday school. The biggest class he ever had was six kids. See, here, here's the problem. That's how we look at things. That's how we look at things. We look at he looked a thousand people. Woo! He's a success. This guy here, he couldn't even go to science school class. He taught it for 40 years. See, God says, the man that did what I gave him to do, and the woman that did what I gave her to do, they both perform my will. And so they're both rewarded equally on that basis. They did what they were supposed to do according to what God gave them to do. Amen. David said 400 men went up and fought in battle. They did what they were able to do. And they'll be rewarded for performing according to their ability. The 200 men that stayed behind and did what they were able to do. And they will be rewarded for performing according to their ability. Listen, that is all that God asked of you all that he asks of you and I, once we're saved and placed in the body of Jesus Christ, is to do what we can. It's all that we can. Okay. Now here's what you're going to learn. And the message is entitled, Find Your Place. So the first thing you've got to begin to think about is, what is, my, what is my place? What is my position? What is my talent? What is my... We all have one. Don't sit there and go, I don't have no talent. My calling in life is to sit here and be quiet. No, that's not it. We all have something. God has not asked every single one of us to do the same thing. He has not asked every one of us to serve to the same extent. 
He has not asked every one of us to accomplish to the same degree. All that he has asked is that each and every one of us yield our life to his control. And then whatever it is that he's enabled you and I to do, that we do it to the fullest of our God-given ability. That's all he has. Amen. In Mark chapter 14, Jesus Christ speaks about the woman who came and uh, anointed him here. And he says this to her. That of course, the disciples are complaining about what she's done. The wasting of the anointing oil, what it could have been sold for. And, but he says, listen to what I'm going to read it. You listen to what he says. He says, let her alone. Right, trouble ye her. She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But ye have not all. Uh, but me, but me, ye not, have not always. She, she hath done. Here's the phrase I want you to hear. She hath done what she could. Let her alone. She hath done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body to the burial. Now listen, when it comes to you and I, hey, when it comes to you have done. You have done what you could in your life. Then you'll hear Jesus Christ say those same words to you. And there'll be no greater word spoken to judge the of Christ. And listen, he did what he could. So the thought is, are you doing what you could? Are you doing what God has enabled you to do? When you stand before God and Jesus Christ says, this man or this woman did everything they possibly could, could have done with the situations and the abilities that I gave them, then there will be no greater reward handed out in the judgment seat of Christ than the reward you will receive for having done what God gave you to do to the best of your God-given ability. Now, I don't know about you, but I appreciate that. You know, I hear other men preach. I go and hear men preach. I listen to men preach. And I think, man, I stink compared to that. I wish I could, you know, preach like that. But you know what? God didn't call me to preach like that. God didn't even call me to be him. <clears throat> the question will be, is did I do to the best of my ability where God put me what he gave me? It's not going to be, well, you know, this guy, no, I'm not going to be compared. It's going to be, did I do for what God gave me to the best of my ability? And that's going to be the question for you as well. You're not going to skip out. No one's skipping out the judgment. Will Jesus Christ be able to look at you? There's God, there's you, and say, hey, this, this lady did. But it, with what I gave her, she did to the best of her ability. <clears throat> Will he be able to say that? <clears throat> This, this is a, well, I'll give you two political thoughts real quick. In that verse, the verse that I read you from Mark, he said, uh, for you have the poor with you always. So this whole campaign, worldwide campaign to eradicate poverty, never going to happen. Right. You're going to always have the what? Poor. Poor, okay. Just, just in case you were, you got sidetracked by that. But here's, here, listen to this phrase. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men you ever heard that phrase? Is that in our founding documents? Okay, now, all men are created equal. Have you ever looked around? Have you ever seen two men in your life that were created equal? It's not a trick question. Have you ever seen two women on the face of the earth that were created equal? Listen, I may think I'm something. So I go to the gym. And there's a big old dude in there. I thought I was big. Until I walked into LA Fitness and said, Whoa! That, where did he come from? That's not even normal. The guy's carrying thighs around on his arms. Amen? But I, I've been working out hard. And then, there, and then I think, that dude's huge. And then a little later, some other guy came back. He's huger. I know that's not correct. He's like, whoa, dude, monster. He makes that guy look small. We're not, listen, we're not creating evil. They don't panic on me. That's all we hear about. Equality, equal rights. Listen, none of us are equal in anything. None of us look the same. We all said, Amen. Amen. 
None of us think the same. None of us have the same desire. None of us have the same abilities. Listen, we're all different. Amen? Amen. And we're thankful for that. So if we're not all equal, what are we? We all are a special creation of God is what we are. Amen. Each and every single one of us is a special creation of God. Listen, one of the great things about America has been our insistence that every man and every woman is an individual. Is an individual. One of the major reasons that socialism has not taken root, oh, it's close, but it hasn't taken root in our country is because of our desire for individualism. When you look at Europe, which is awash with socialism, you know what happened? They broke down individuality in those nations and they all became a melting pot of socialism. Now here, here's what's taking place in America is through John Dewey and progressive education. See, what progressive education does, it takes the focus off the individual. See, a traditional Christian school, our traditional classroom, and we are a Christian school and we teach a traditional education, which means a teacher stands in front of the students and gives them the facts and gives them the truth, and then the kids are get their grades based on how they do it. Okay. Progressive education, public school education, groups are back together. See, now we're not individuals, we're a group. Now, you can agree with me or disagree, but what has happened in the last hundred years is that they have prepared a couple generations of young people for socialism. They are taking away their identity, their individuality, and putting them in groups, and that's just preparing you for socialism, which is a kind word, the nicer version of communism. Right. Now, you may say, I don't agree with you. Listen, when God saved you, did he make us all the same? No, he kept us as one. Individuals. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. Were the 12 disciples all alike? No. Go through and read about all your Bible characters. Go from Noah all the way through Peter and John and I. Where God saves our soul, but he keep, we keep our identity of who we are as individuals. We're not broke. They don't all of a sudden get a robe and start walking like this and talk real funny when we got saved. So God is for individuality. But you've got to strip that away if you're ever going to get control of masses. Right. All right? So thank God we still have a little bit of individuality in America. But what has been taking place in our nation, whether it's through education or through Hollywood, is they've been trying over the past hundred years or so is to break down the emphasis on the individual and get everybody to look alike, think alike, and talk alike. And one of the greatest means for doing that is Hollywood and TV. Because they have broken down the barrier and removed the thought that everybody in America is not the same. You ever travel to New England? I don't even know what some of those people are saying up there. They got, they got, there's a guy who comes to recruit me from New Hampshire. I, I have to listen very carefully. And he's talking a foreign language. He's from New Hampshire. I, I, mean, I can't even take. If I did it, it sounds Oriental. I'm not going to do it, okay? <laughs> Everything comes out Oriental when I try to impersonate. So, uh, and, uh, and no one knows what an Oriental person from New Hampshire sounds like, amen? So, uh, but you know, you got to listen. You get some from the West Coast. You get some of these folks from the deep South. You're like, what? What is she saying? And in the dialogue. But here's what has happened. Listen, you don't have hometown news people anymore. These people that we watch, channels, well, I don't watch them, but Channel 2, 6, and 9, they, they've been hired from somewhere else. They're hired based on their looks. We're going to watch Channel 2 today, the best looking anchor. They're not from Orlando. People up there uh, in, in middle Georgia, people doing their news, they're not from middle Georgia. They graduate from university and they've been hired to come in there. They say, what are you getting at? What has happened is because of television, we're all the same now. Think about it. Everybody hears the same talk, whether you're on the East Coast or the West Coast, North or South. Everybody sees the same commercials. We watch the same programs. We all receive the same influences. There's nothing different. It's programming. Programming you to be a, a mass, not an individual. We don't have local hometown newspapers anymore. I mean, listen, every newspaper in America gets their major stories from one or two news sources. That's why the most interesting part of the newspaper is the editorial. When they let someone who has a mind to write a different opinion, amen. 
And so because of that, everybody thinks the same. Everybody acts the same. This is why I'm against the mainstream media, the news mafia. All that is is programming. So where do people learn to think like that? They watch too much TV. That's where they get it from. And so as a result of taking away our individuality, you can round everybody up and put them in one big socialist pie. And nobody protests because, listen, we're all equal, right? No, we're not. No, we're not. Listen, none of us were equal before we got saved, and none of us are equal after we got saved. What we are is a special creation of God. See, in the body of Christ, now listen to me, because this was the problem here. These 400 men said, hey, they're not equal. They, they, they don't get what we can. We went and fought. They stayed back here by the stomach. We get to spoil. They don't get it. Listen, in the body of Christ, none of us are, none of us are equal. Everyone is entirely different. And that's why we don't have pictures hanging on the wall saying this is what a Christian man must look like and this is what a Christian woman must look like. I say, why don't we? Because we're all different. We're all different. But I'll tell you that every one of us needs to get before God and find out what He has given us, what He's given you to do. The abilities, the talents, the gifts, the capabilities, the circumstances you've gone for, the situations you've had in life. And you need to find out what is your place in his army. What is your role? What is it you're supposed to be doing? You need to come to God and say, God, what is my place in your army? Lord, what is, what is my purpose in your great body? And then, Lord, having found that place, help me to fulfill it the best of my ability. And whether it's missions, door knocking, witnessing, teaching Sunday school, teaching in a Christian school, it, it doesn't matter. What, whatever it is, listen, when, when someone gets saved, God puts a mark beside the name of every single person that had a part in getting the gospel to that individual. We all have parts to play. The reward doesn't just go to the one that did this for God or the one that did that for God. The reward goes to everyone that did what they could to get the gospel to the individual. The bus driver, the giver, the prayer warrior, the one who lit the stamp and put it on the envelope to send the invitation to invite them to church. Hey, the one who organized the tracks. Hey, the one who put it the mass. Hey, the one who drove the van and dropped the people off. Listen, everybody that did what they could to have a part in that person's salvation. And listen, and without every part functioning, the end result could not have come to pass. Well, I just can't do what he can do. Do what God gave you to do. Well, I just don't have the same ability that woman has. You have the ability that God gave you. Amen. What are you doing with it? Now, in our account tonight, who won the battle? David, the 400 men that were with him. That's what we would say. But David clarified. He said, hey, we didn't win the battle. He said, God gave us the victory. God won the battle. And he rewarded the 400 that did what they could. And he rewarded the 200 that did what they could. See, the victory was the Lord's, and the reward was for those that took their place in the victory and did their part. Take your Bible, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at this a little bit more. New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. It says, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. He says, Paul says, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Amen. 400 went to battle, 200 tarried by the stuff. But God gave the victory. He says, I have planted the polished water, but God gave the increase. Verse 7, so then neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth. But God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his 
own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's ability. So Paul says, listen, Paul said, hey, I, I don't have a watering ministry. I have a claiming ministry. And Paul says, listen, I, I don't have a claiming ministry. I have a watering ministry. And someone else would come along and say, listen, I don't have a planting ministry or a watering ministry. I have a harvesting ministry. The bottom line is, is whatever fruit is harvested, listen, it's God's doing. It's God's doing. We will not be rewarded for what was accomplished because the accomplishments are God's. We will be rewarded for performing our part in the work of God. The way God wanted us to do it. Amen. We will be rewarded for doing our part in the work of God. The problem we have today is there's a lot of people not doing their part. And it makes the church look weak and sickly. Because people won't do their part. Well, you get all excited and someone walks the aisle and you get to take them to the side and you leave them to the Lord and that's fantastic. You think, well, he's going to get the reward. He went to the Lord to see what you didn't see were the people and the time and the effort and the labor that went to getting that person to that pew to walk that aisle to get saved. And all you had to do was just sit down with them, share a few verses with them, and they received Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's a blessing. That's the ministry of harvesting. But before they ever got here, there was planting. And there was watering, and, and there was prayer, and there was people who invested in that individual before you ever had the blessing of leading them to the Lord. We look around at Victory Baptist Church and the ministries God has given us, the Christian school. We're excited now to have the Spanish work going on, and we're thrilled at what's going on. But let me ask you a question tonight. What is Victory Baptist Church? Oh, well, it's 1601 well, it's the No, it's not the buildings. Victory Baptist Church is a body. Amen. According to Scripture, we are a body. Now look at, uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so what is Victory Baptist Church? It is a body. And in that body, Victory Baptist Church is everybody performing what they can perform. Everybody doing what they are able to do as God has given them. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, go to verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. Here we begin to talk about, in the first part of the chapter, Paul's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then we get to verse 12, he starts talking about the body of Christ. Now, if you're saved, and you're a Victory Baptist Church, you are part of the body of Christ, correct? Okay. Let's read some verses. It says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now listen, your physical body, your body that you, you have, you're, you're in the pew with it. Your physical body is a picture. It's a type of the body of Christ. The Bible tells us in Ephesians and Colossians that Jesus Christ is the head of the body. So here's, here's Brad Phillips' body. And my body has many members. Thank the Lord it has ten fingers. Two hands. Two arms. Ten toes, two feet, two knees, two shins, two thighs. Got a head on top. Two ears, two eyes. I have a lot of, a lot of members. Just like you. And Victory Baptist Church is a body that has a lot of members. But the members are all part of how many bodies? One. one body. Look at verse 13. For by one spirit are all we baptized into one body. Whether we be Jew, Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Okay, so the body is not one member, it's many members. He says, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Is it? Of course it is. Uh, he says, if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Look at verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, that would be weird. Where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased Him. So there is the body. You get saved and Christ takes you and puts you in that body where He pleases and puts you. And so looking at a body, He says, you got saved because you're going to be an eye. 
That's what he's giving you. You're going to be a thumb. You're going to be a pinky. You're going to be a little toe. And you're going to be a kneecap. You're going to be an arm. You're going to be a mouth. He places you in that body as he says there, as he sees, as it pleased him. Verse 19. And if they were all one member, where were the body? If everybody was a hand, where were the body? Just be a hand laying over there. But now are they many members, yet but one body? Look at it again. But now are they how many members? Many members, yet but one body. Let me give you an illustration. Jose, Brittany, here, here, and had Ezra. Amen? Now imagine when Ezra was born, it was kind of done, it was just real fast, and no one got to really see the out of him. He raised the hand, I want to see, I want to see Ezra, I want to see Ezra. And the nurse said, oh, I can all weird. Brittany's like, oh, I'm still a Okay, okay. And so they take they take her back there to the little nursery, and there's Ezra. He's 24 inches long. He's a seven and a half pound foot. Would she go, oh, look, it's so cute. She's like, ah, but it's ah. I didn't get down to a foot. And we tell that to her. Amen. Okay, he's not a foot. Amen. You said that's a monster. God, listen, God wouldn't do that. God would not have a woman give birth to a foot. God doesn't do things like that. I mean, well, what would, like, when Levi was born, there we were, boosh, 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 and, and there he was, and he was a big ear. He'd be like, get me, get me back. I don't want an ear, I want a son. Well, that's what you got, Mr. Phillips. You got an eight and a half pound ear. That's, that's, that would be, ugh, that would be gross. It would be gross. So, well, what's the problem? Well, suppose if everybody in the church was a preacher. Suppose everybody in the church was a singer. Suppose everybody in the church was a door knocker. I don't know if could be. Anyways, I don't know. You understand what I'm getting to tonight? See, if everybody was the same thing, it wouldn't be a body. It would be a monstrosity. We all have a place in the body. God has put us as he saw fit, as it pleased him, put us as a member somewhere in the body. Now go to verse 21 of 1 Corinthians. We read verse 20, to verse 21. It says, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Now here's what people do. They say, well, preacher, you know, that preacher down there at the church, I just don't care for him. And those people down there are strange and you know, the way they do things down there at that church, and I'm just going to stay home, and I can just be, I can be as close to God. Don't children may say that. I can just be as close to God all by myself as I can down there. I don't need to go to the church. Now listen, here's what God says to You are wrong. Exactly. You are wrong. Now listen to me. Children, do not do this. But if you were going, if you were to cut your finger off and keep it in your pocket, or put it on the mantle at home, You can carry it in your pocket, put it in your shirt pocket, mount it, I don't care what you do with it. But that finger that you cut off is never going to do you a bit of good in the rest of your life. Because that finger only has value as it's attached to your body. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. Cut your arm off. Take it down to the taxidermy here. I can't think of the master's taxidermy. Have to stuff your arm and put it on the wall. You can look at it all you want. But that arm's going to be good for nothing for as long as you live. Because it's not attached to the body. If you're saved tonight, you're no good pulled up at home. You're no good separated from the body of Christ, but I can do my own thing. No. That's against Scripture. You are a member of the body. God has placed you as He as it pleased Him in that body. But here's the question you need to ask God is, what is my place in the body? What member am I? I need to find my place, and whatever that place is, I then need to do it to the best of my ability. It's not, it's not would or should, it's what is could. I need to do what God has given me to do. And some of you have never asked God, what is it you want me to do? Because you're afraid of the answer. 
but he's put you, he's placed you in the vine. You need to find out what your part is. So we've learned tonight, just as we learned from David's men, you're part of the body of Christ. And you need to find the place God's given you in that body. And find a place where you can serve and function in that body. And get over this idea that you don't need the rest of the members of the body. And that they don't need you. That's not so. We all need each other. I need all my members. Amen? Amen. Now, those of us that are getting a little older, it's a little irritating when the members are not cooperating with the body. Amen. Amen. Same in church. We all need to be working together. Working together. You're a part of Victory Baptist Church. You're a part of this local body. You are a member of this body. Have you ever found your place? What ability, what, what talent, what is it that God has prepared you to do that you haven't done? You need to do your part so the body functions as it ought to function. And so it can be all that this body needs to be for the cause of Jesus Christ in this particular location that God has placed this body. You are a member of this body. Find, find your place that God's given you in this body. And then serve and function in his body to the nature. And if everybody will do their part, you'll be amazed what God can do for Victory Baptist Church. Everybody has a part. But you gotta find your part. You gotta do it. Find your place. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time tonight for the word of God. 400 men fought, but 200 men, as David said, tarried by the stuff. They did what they could do. We need to ask.